guys, and welcome to chapter 4 and 5. Today we start our journey in chapter 4. We will be looking at waves and energy and how they have affected and changed what we know about the electrons in an atom. So let's begin with a little review of the atomic structure. We started off with Dalton, and Dalton believed that the atom was the smallest piece of matter. It was indivisible and basically a solid sphere. So we just have a circle. Then we move on to Thompson. Thompson elaborated on this solid sphere and said, well, it's not really solid sphere because it has this negative charge. So we must have a negative charge within this atom because all elements had this negative charge. And this is often referred to as our plum pudding model. If you've ever eaten plum pudding, I guess this makes more sense. Then we went on to Rutherford. And Rutherford, we know, said, well, it's not this giant sphere of negative charge. There's actually a small sphere that has positive charge and, of course, the neutrons inside. But then surrounding the outside is all of this negative charge that Thompson found. However, there's a few problems with Rutherford's model. The first one is where exactly are those electrons located? He told us that they were outside the nucleus, but where? Are they just floating there? Are they far? Are they close? We don't know much about that electron and where they're located. Plus, if the, let's say, middle is positive, outside is negative, well, what do we know about charges? Well, opposites attract. So why don't these negative electrons just kind of fall back into the nucleus? To help explain what happens and why the electrons stay out there, we are going to look at the study of light. So let's throw that away and we move on. So let's look at the wave description of light. First we have the electromagnetic radiation. We're going to abbreviate it EMR just because electromagnetic radiation is a lot to write. So when I have you write it, if you want to put EMR, as long as you know what you're talking about. Well, electromagnetic radiation is the form of energy that exhibits wave-like behavior. And if we put together all the different forms of energy that exhibit wave-like behavior, we get an electromagnetic spectrum. So this is just all forms of electromagnetic radiation. So in our picture, you can see uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Now this goes for very small waves to very large waves. Gamma rays being very dangerous to us, to radio waves and TV waves uh, that really aren't that dangerous. So these are less dangerous. However, the important thing to know is that within this whole spectrum, we only see within this range. So our eyes can only take in this small section of, I guess, radiation for us to see and decipher between the colors. So no matter what type of radiation we are looking at, it all moves at the same speed. And we give that the letter C. And this is the speed of light. So it is a constant, and the constant is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So yes, this is a number you will want to commit to memory. So 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that is our speed of light. So any type of radiation that you have depends on this speed or will move at this speed. So let's look at properties of waves. First one we're going to look at is wavelength. And the little symbol there is lambda. It's just a Greek symbol that helps when you are doing types of equations to keep all of the different variables uh, separate. Uh, so this is the distance between corresponding points on adjacent waves. Next we have frequency. Frequencies like a V called mu. So this is the number of waves that pass a given point in a specific amount of time. 
time usually being one second. So basically you can think of yourself as standing up here at the top uh, and then you're going to count how many waves pass you in a second. So when does the next crest hit? How long does that take? That would be your frequency. Your wavelength then is from crest to crest. It doesn't have to be crest to crest. It can be trough to trough or it can be any similar spot on adjacent waves. So it doesn't need to be, it's just usually we look at it from the top to the top. So that's wavelength, frequency, how often that wave passes us in a second. For frequency, the unit is hertz. For wavelength, the unit uh, is meters. Often you'll see it in nanometers just because the size of the waves that we are getting. And we need to remember that if we're looking in nanometers, Nano is 10 to the negative 9. So keep that in mind as you're going through because there are going to be some conversions that you will have to make to work with these problems. Now when we work with wavelength and frequency, we notice that they are inversely proportional. So what do we know about inverse proportions? Well, we know that two constant or two numbers are going to be multiplied together to equal a constant. So we're going to multiply something by something and we're going to get a constant. Well what constant would help us relate wavelength and frequency? That's right, it is C. So do we remember what C is? That's right, C is the speed of light which has a constant value of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. This funny symbol represented what? Wavelength. And this one was our frequency. So the two are multiplied together. So it does mean that they are inversely proportional, which means as one goes down, the other one goes up. So in our picture, you can see that when we shorten a wavelength, we're going to get a higher frequency. When we lengthen our wavelength, so longer wavelength, we get a lower frequency. So they are inversely proportional to each other. So how did we use waves to help us find out about the electron? Well, we studied something called the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is the emission of electrons from a metal when light shines on the metal. So we shine light on a metal and something happens to that metal. Well, we found that light must be of a certain frequency to actually react with a metal. So we've got this red light coming in and you can see nothing happens. It just hits the metal and whip de doo but then we have this green light coming in. It hits the metal and it shoots off an electron or it moves an electron. Uh, it, again, it's got to be a certain light, but this really raised some eyebrows. How does light move an electron? Because light does move an electron, it really cannot be explained by the wave theory. So this photoelectron or photoelectric effect really left a big question. So if we can't describe it in waves, why not describe it in particles? So when we look at particles, we have to give this idea of light as a particle. So we call it quantums. So this is going to be an, the minimum energy lost or gained by an atom. So as this light comes in and it hits the atom and it moves an electron, it's going to take some energy to do that. Not all light can move the electron, so it has to be some minimum energy that can be lost or gained by the atom. And we're going to call this a packet of energy. So a quantum is a packet of energy that can be released, which is particle-like. And it's not going to be a stream of energy, which would be more wave-like. So we're taking this idea of light and putting it into energy or little energy packets. To explain this in energy, 
or packets of energy, we have a new equation, and that is E equals HV. So E is going to be our energy. Makes sense, starts with E. So E is our energy. Our unit we're going to use is the joule. H is going to be Planck's constant. So guess what? The guy that studied this and did all of these equations was Planck. So he goes through and he looks at these different metals and this photoelectric effect and how it reacts and comes up with this constant. So H is our constant. And that constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. So joules being energy, seconds for our frequency. So again, another num number you want to commit to memory. And this time we find that E and V are directly proportional. So if they're directly proportional, that means they were divided to equal a constant. So if we rearranged this equation to solve for H, which is our constant, you would see we would have E over V. So E over V means they're divided for a constant, so they're going to be directly proportional. And what does directly proportional mean? As one increases, the other also increases. So they do the same thing. So let's use these two equations that we know to try and tell us a little bit more about waves that we can see. So if we see purple light, purple light has a frequency of about 7.42 times 10 to the 14th hertz. We want to know what does this mean about its wavelength. So we're going to use the equation C equals wavelength times frequency. All we need to do is plug into that equation. So for C, we have 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that equals our wavelength, which we don't know. So if you want, you can leave it as wavelength instead of turning it to x, times our frequency, which is 7.42 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So if we want to solve for wavelength then, we know wavelength is 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 7.42 times 10 to the 14th. Putting this into our calculator then, we get our wavelength equaling about 4.04 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. Again, since that is a pretty small number, you'll often see this written as 404 nanometers. So same number, and just moving our decimal place to make it a negative 9 instead of a negative 7. But again, just using numbers, plugging them into an equation, simple algebra. So one is the, what is the energy of one quanta of light? So quanta for a quantum. So what is that one packet of energy going to be? This time we use the other equation. So we're going to use E equals HV. Energy is what we're looking for, so we can leave that as E. H is Planck's constant. So this is our 6.6, .6, oops, 626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds times our frequency which we found from the problem to get our frequency 7.42 times 10 to the 14th Hertz which is basically a per second so the seconds will cancel out and our energy equals 4.92 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Again, plug into the equation what you know. Two equations you need are this one and this one. One of them, or both of them, each have one letter as a constant that doesn't change. So then you're going to be given the other one, and you just solve for one 
unknown. Again, simple plug and chug of algebra. Let's look at our pra second practice problem. So let's look at the other end of this visible spectrum. Let's look at red light. Red light has a wavelength of 728 nanometers. Now, what's going to stand out to us is we are in nanometers, and we know that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So if we are going to work with both of these, we've got to change one of them. The easier one to change is going to be our 728. When we plug it into our equation, C equals wavelength times frequency, we're going to keep this as 3 times 10 to the 8th, meters per second and we're going to change our wavelength to 728 nano being 10 to the negative 9 so times 10 to the negative 9 meters now my meters will cancel so that I can get my Hertz which is also my per second so times my frequency so I solve for frequency and I get 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 728 times 10 to the negative 9. And my frequency comes out to be 4.12 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So when we look at what energy this wave carries, we plug it into the equation E equals HV. E again is what we're looking for. H is Planck's constant, so 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. We're going to use our frequency that we just found, so 4.12 times 10 to the 14th. And we solve for E, and we get 2.73 times 10 to the negative 19. Again, try to use that EE button. So you don't have to use parentheses when you're working with your scientific notation. So the big question is, does light behave as a particle because it can move electrons or does it behave more as a wave because we can measure the energy and we look at its wavelength and we look at its frequency. So to answer this question is our big man on campus. Mr. Einstein. Mr. Einstein says, why choose? Why can't it be both a wave and a particle? So he says a stream of photons will have wave-like behavior. A photon is just a particle of electromagnetic radiation that has zero mass but carries a quantum of energy. Remember that quantum is that minimum amount of energy. Uh, so each metal is going to contain its own frequency to move electrons due to the forces that hold them to the atom. Remember, the electrons don't fall into the nucleus, so there's got to be something that is holding them in uh, this distance away from the nucleus so that they don't fall in. So he's saying each metal is going to contain its own frequency that is going to then be able to move electrons. Remember, energy and frequency are directly related. So to study this, we're going to look at hydrogen. So why look at hydrogen? Well, hydrogen's special. Hydrogen only has one proton and one electron. So if we want to know how the light moves electrons, we're going to want to study an element that only has one electron. That way we know when we light, shine different lights on hydrogen, we can see where that electron is moving. So electrons are going to start in the ground state. This is the lowest energy state of the atom. So everything is all hunky-dory. Uh, it's calm. It's relaxed. If you want, it's sleeping. If you were in your ground state right now, you would be sleeping. You wouldn't be watching this video. But because you are watching this video, you are said to be in an excited state. You are an atom that has higher potential energy. So when the electrons move, they are now considered in an excited state. And the atom itself then has higher potential energy because it took in energy to move the electron. When that electron eventually returns back to the ground state, 
it's going to give off energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Just like eventually you're going to stop watching this video and then you're going to go to bed. Uh, so hopefully you don't do that during the video, but I guess that's your prerogative if you want to. But you can go, or when you go back to bed, you have returned back to your ground state and you have given off some of your energy. The atom follows the same path. It wants to be in a ground state, light's going to hit it, it's going to gain energy, it's going to go into an excited state, and then it's going to return back to its ground state. How we know that this happens is through line emission spectrums. So when a beam of light from electromagnetic radiation shines through a prism, it separates into specific wavelengths. Of course, there's only certain ones we can see, so we look at the ones within the visible region. Below then is the continuous spectrum. So continuous, you can see, it looks more like a rainbow. There is no division of color. They kind of all blend together. The line emission spectrum is specific lines. And you can see for different elements, you get different line emission spectrums. In the continuous, there is going to be no separation of wavelengths. So kind of like a rainbow outside. You don't see the specific red, orange, yellow, green, blue lines. Uh, so that would be continuous. Line emission is when you actually see the different lines. So looking at hydrogen's line emission spectrum, we see that there are four specific lines. So hydrogen must have four specific or fixed energy states. So looking at the energy states. Level one here in our picture is going to be the ground state. So down here is our ground. This is when we are sleeping, we are happy, we're not exerting any energy. That means level two through four, so two or four, three, and two, these are all excited states. So as light hits the hydrogen, it moves electrons. Uh, it can move to then two, three, or four. As it then falls back down to uh, its ground state, it gives off some kind of electromagnetic radiation. So we fall from an excited state back to the ground state. So any excited state back to the ground state is called the Lyman series. If you fall from any excited state back to the energy level two, so you don't make it all the way back to the ground state, but you're in this uh, still semi-excited state, we are said to be in the Balmer series. And it's in this, when we fall to level two, that we see that we are in the visible region. And then a fall from an excited state to energy level three. So again, we're not quite making it back to the ground state, but we have lost energy. We have given off energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. We are in the passion series. So we give each series of events or of falls, depending on how far they go, fall, a series name. So how does this build on our atom? Well, we get Bohr. Bohr comes up with his own model of the hydrogen atom. And he says that it, the electrons don't fall into the nucleus because they are in fixed energy orbits. So they're not just willy-nilly out there surrounding the nucleus somewhere, but they are in specific energy orbits. And he says that the electrons cannot be between these orbits. So these circles are our energy orbits. So specific energy levels. So if you want, this would be your ground. Then you have level one, level two, level three. And he says electrons cannot be in between these orbits. So just like when you're walking up the steps, you're going to be on the step um, or on the higher step, but you can't be halfway in between. If you were going to jump onto a ledge, you can't jump halfway. So you're either going to be on the bottom or you're going to be on the ledge. You can't hover halfway in between. Electrons can't also. They have to be at those specific energy levels. Electrons further from the nucleus are going to contain more energy. So the further out you are, 
So out here you're going to have high energy and here you have low. So the further away you get from the nucleus, the more energy you contain. And electrons will move to a higher energy, higher energy level when energy abs is absorbed and then it will emit energy when it falls. So in order for this electron to go from here up to here, energy must come in. So energy comes in, hits the electron. So we're going to absorb energy. However, if this one goes back down, it's going to emit energy. So when you fall back down, emit or it takes in energy to move up. And that is where we're going to leave you tonight with this model of the atom.